Well, thank you very much. And thank you for the witnesses for being here. This is such an incredibly important discussion. And again, I want to reiterate um, what my colleagues have said about Major Brennan and her incredible testimony uh, over the weekend, but also how incredibly and fundamentally jarring uh, the specter and breadth and depth of that commentary was. And that's why the work we are doing here is so incredibly important. And I will want to revisit, um, Madam Chair, why uh, the possibility of having two of the witnesses that we have here today come back again on another occasion so that we might be able to go into more depth uh, on their testimony. Uh, Mr. Drippel, when the minister testified before a committee, he said that he had always passed everything to the proper authority. I just want to clarify from your testimony in the case of possible allegations, whatever they may be, the minister was in fact himself the proper authority and had not only the duty, but the facility to act. The buck stops with him. Is that your testimony? My testimony is having received a caution from the ombudsman, and the ombudsman had no one else to turn to except the minister. Now the minister saddled with these allegations. He had a duty to first investigate and second report, and he had the tools and the authority to investigate under Section 45 of the National Defense Act. He also had a duty to report, presumably after having investigated the matter summarily or, or fully, to PCO, given the CDS is a governor in council appointment. Along the way, he might have elected to suspend, not to remove, to suspend the CDS whilst this matter was being investigated. I think any removal, of course, of a government council is outside the authority of the minister. That would probably involve cabinet or, or, or the prime minister or both. Thank you. In a democracy, the trust and confidence in a standing military is fundamentally dependent on elected civilian oversight, i.e., a Minister of National Defense. Yet, we understand the possibility, as a result of this minister's friendship and working relationship and long history and possibly other compromising uh, information between Minister Sajjan and Ch former Chief of Defense Stant Jonathan Vance, there may in fact be a conflict of interest with the minister hindering his ability to carry out his duties as a minister. Could you provide us some comment? What do we, as members of parliament or Canadian citizens, how do we ensure that a minister of national defense is not compromised, not able to be leveraged or influenced, and is able to carry out his critical oversight as an elected official of a standing military that has the right to bear arms. Mr. Seldes, uh, permit me to say two comments in response to your questions. First and foremost, there are two key players that should also have been involved in the decision-making by the minister. First and foremost, the deputy minister. Just by the very nature of her title and rank, She's there to advise the minister on all range of issues that the minister could rely upon to receive advice. First. Second, the minister immediate subordinate is a judge advocate general who is school and expert in military law. The, 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 the combination of both the deputy minister and the judge advocate general should have provided the minister with all of the advice that he requires to respond to this. But now, Mr. Drepo, who thank you. investigates the minister? 